Well, good morning. And thank you for, for being here um, on this illustrious game day. And thank you so much, John, for that introduction. Um, I was kidding, John. You know, uh, I had to thank him for making me do this, because this was a, you know, an, an extra thing that you have to do as a faculty member. But I just have to say, um, it has been such a privilege to put this talk together, um, to walk with these African-American saints in waiting that I'll introduce. Um, so I just want to thank John, thank um, all of the staff of the McGrath Institute for Church Life for taking this on. And um, hopefully, over the next 45 minutes, you'll come to learn uh, to love these folks the way that, that I have um, through, through my walk as an educator and as a Catholic, as an African-American, and as a faculty member here at the University of Notre Dame. So I know we're masked up, but I'm going to start, um, this is a, one of our lecture halls, with a little bit of, of classroom audience participation. So the, the question, and John already began to answer the question for himself, uh, McGrath, but, but why is it important to venerate saints? Why do we venerate the saints? Yes, sir. Yeah, thank you. They, they kind of, they, they illuminate what's possible for ourselves, right? We can aspire to them. Um, how, why else might we venerate saints? Yes. They walk amongst us. Yeah. They walk amongst us, right? We are a part of a communion of saints. And um, walking with them and being guided by them are kind of, you know, the essence of a, of a Christian life, right? Uh, a couple more. Why do we venerate the saints? Yes, ma'am. We use them as models and, and intercessory prayers. Well. Yes, yeah, so they're, they're intercessors and, and they're also models. And then I saw one hand over here. Yep. And we know that uh, they are a place like we are, and so we can walk in their shoes. And so thank you, thank you. Yes, all of this, right? They're models, guys. Yes, ma'am. To honor them. Yes, and, and to honor them, right? All of these are important. So uh, like I started this question um, myself by, by kind of looking at um, some guidance from the U.S. Council of Catholic Bishops, and they mention all of the things that, that you mentioned, a couple of things that I want to call out, because we'll continue to come back and kind of why, why the need. Like when we advocate for those who are saints in waiting who are not yet saints, like what are we advocating for per se? And what is it that we want to see in those individuals? But what can they help us see in ourselves, right? Are the big questions, as, as you all brought up in your responses. So from the USCCB, um, you know, a couple of things. Those who lived heroically virtuous lives, right? And the question of what, what that means, what that looks like today. Um, and, you know, a, a book by my colleague, um, Kathy Cummins, who talks about the need for American saints to kind of help us think about what that virtuous life, life looks like, what it means to imitate here in the United States. Um, and the, the second point, whose lives are worthy of imitation. What does it mean to imitate? Uh, so I, I love this series, the idea that the more we get to know these, these uh, folks, the more we can think about what it means to imitate them, what it means to be like them. Um, what you'll see, though, from the, the USCCB is that uh, there are not very many <laughs> American saints uh, just yet, right? There are just 11, um, and there are probably another dozen that are kind of on the cusp um, that, are, that are blessed. Or, or venerable, but, but not, a, not a huge yet, list yet. And, and clearly, um, there, there are no African Americans uh, on the list just yet, um, blessed or, or canonized. So we think about um, what does it mean to imitate? And, and I, I started that question even earlier in thinking about um, who is it that is doing the imitating? And, and this is an important question. We think about who is the church? Uh, in my work, I ask questions kind of not just what is the church, but who is the church and where is the church? So we think about the need for saints today. Um, about 10 years ago, the National Black Catholic Congress um, did a census of, of, of African and diaspora um, Catholics around the world. The number they came up with then in 2014 was about 270 million. Um, black Catholics around the world, about one in four. Um, and so they break it down. And it's pretty um, evenly divided between East and West, about uh, 140 million in the continent of Africa and about 130 million in the Americas, North and South America. Um, and that number continues to grow. I remember looking at a, an article uh, when we were in Rome talking about the future of the church really being defined by this growth in, in, in Africa and in South America. Uh, 
Catholic schools, and I'll, keep, I'll come back to this notion of, of one of the reasons why it's really important to think about the individuals I'll talk about is, is the importance of Catholic schools to our mission. Um, there are about uh, 50 million to 60 million children in Catholic schools around the world. 30 million of those are um, on the continent of Africa. Right? So one in four Catholics who walk the planet are African or from the diaspora. One in two children in Catholic schools are African from the diaspora. Those are huge, huge numbers. Um, here in the United States, um, there are three million African American Catholics. And uh, one of the things that I think in our legacy, we really have to be proud of, um, the first school to serve African Americans was Catholic in the early 18th century, right? So we're, we're talking about um, 300 plus years um, that Africans have been educated in the United States um, by Catholic schools. Um, and so that's also um, very, very important. You'll see one of the through lines that John asked me to talk about all six of the, uh, the saints in waiting. And um, one of the through lines that brings them together is their focus on education, education being such a part of healing, such a part of development, such a part of learning to love yourself, to see yourself as God sees you, but also to be an efficacious person in the world. And as John mentioned in the introduction, that's, that's largely the work that I do, how I came to know uh, these folks in my own work. So we think about this road um, to sainthood, and um, I think about the, these saints in waiting, um, those that have been uh, declared venerable and those that have been declared servants of God that I'll talk about. Um, it's a long, long road. And I don't expect to see any of these individuals canonized in my lifetime. But the work starts now. Right? So we think about this four-step process. And most of the people who are um, spoken about in this series have already um, been canonized as saints. Um, but we have uh, three of the six um, who are uh, declared servants of God. So they're in the first, first step. And um, three who've been declared venerable. Um, none who are blessed are, are obviously none who are saints yet. But that means we leave with homework. We leave with work to do. Um, because it's going to be, um, as, I, as I'll end it, um, the conversations we have, um, the prayers we offer, the petitions we make, um, that's going to determine whether this happens. Um, you know, many of us will, will see this happen from the other side of life, but it will happen. Uh, and so I'm, I am uh, grateful to McGrath and um, hopefully uh, this, and I know there was a talk on Thea Bowman that was given a, a few weeks ago, will really light a fire in the Notre Dame community, faculty, staff, alumni, students, um, friends of Notre Dame, that we say this is something that's really important to us. It's important to the church. Um, that we continue to, uh, to carry the banner for these individuals. So what I'd like to do now is spend the balance of my time introducing you to these six individuals, a little bit about their life, um, why um, the cause is worthy, where you might find some more information about them, um, and, and then um, the, the, the petitions that have been offered for them. So the first is uh, the venerable Father Augustus Tolton. Uh, so Father Tolton is known as the, as the first African-American Catholic priest in the United States. He was born near the end of slavery in the, in the mid-1850s um, in Missouri. And he had you know, parents who, who were pretty ambitious about getting him out of those conditions. His father actually escaped slavery to join the Union Army to fight in the war. So you can tell by the, by the math. Uh, that, that Augustus was a young boy, eight or nine years old when this happened. Um, and his father died of dysentery uh, during the war. And so his mom knew that she had to get him out. Uh, and so you, you, can, you can learn more about that, that journey, but it was an arduous journey from Missouri to ultimately Illinois, to Chicago. So he's a, he's, he's, he's a local um, priest. And you know they were almost captured a few times, and she had to kind of put him in a canoe and row him across and, uh, rivers and, and get him to freedom. So shortly after the war, I mean, he was still a very young boy and um, you know, an industrious boy and wanted to, to attend school, but could not. You know? So he was going to work in the, you know, in the streets of Quincy, Illinois. Um, and kind of gazed upon this school, St. Peter's Catholic School. And I like to call out these schools because this is such an important part of our history, not just um, the Augustus Tolton's history. And so there was an Irish priest there named Peter McGurr, and he saw this boy, 
And uh, he said, you need, to come to, you need to come to school, right? We, we need to get you in. And um, there, there was a little bit of protest, but not a ton. He says, if, if anyone's upset about this, they're going to answer to me. And no one wanted to answer to Father McGurr. So uh, Augustus Tolton became a student at this school and began to shine. I mean, he was uh, an amazing student. He was a bright light. He was all the things that you could imagine a young boy of you know, 12 or 13 being. Um, and so they, they began to enroll him to teach religion and teach catechism at this school, and he was just a talent. And it became clear um, to them that he had a calling. And it became clear to him that he had a calling. So they began this letter-writing campaign, they um, being the priest and the sisters at the school, um, writing to every seminary in America to accept uh, Augustus as a seminarian. And the letters just came back one by one, no, 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 no. Seven years, um, they wrote letters. And no seminary in the United States would take him. So they didn't despair. Um, I'm not sure who it was. Um, uh, Maybe the bishop, a lot of, of, of folks in Chicago are taking up the cause. Uh, they decided perhaps we can have him study in Rome. And in Rome, they said, absolutely. Absolutely. And there were other um, seminarians from the continent of Africa that were studying in Rome. And so he, he, went, he went to the Vatican. He studied <laughs> for to be a priest um, in Rome. Uh, and again, uh, continued to excel and as the story has it, um, he saw his calling um, to go to the continent of Africa and be a priest. And, and, and that was where he was headed. Until the night before, there was a cardinal, an Italian cardinal, who said, uh, I've thought about this and prayed on it. And where we feel you really need to go is home. Home to Chicago. So they sent him back, and clearly, you know, there, was, there, were, there were no seminaries that would accept African Americans. He was the first priest in the nation um, who had been trained in Rome and uh, became this really dynamic priest in the Chicago area um, for the duration of his life. He was known um, as an amazing preacher. He obviously worked in integrated parishes, and folks sought him out. Um, and he was just a gifted interlocutor and, and, and the light and a bright spirit. And they, Love him to this day in Chicago. And the, the folks that are most ardent advocating for his causes are Archdiocese of Chicago. Um, but he, you know, he, he has a legacy and a cause. He's known for serving others despite hardships. He's known for persevering against the odds. And, and his quiet devotion, I mean, he never called out the suffering that he endured. Um, he just met that suffering with love and with compassion and with dignity. And, um, you know, I, I, I study media. There's a, there's a lot that you can see in that picture. He's a young man, but a dignified young man um, and, and just a, um, a light for the church. Uh, and this is, this is his, the prayer petition for him um, to, uh, to become a saint. And so I have a ton of resources. I don't know how McGrath will share all of this, but um, hopefully this is something that you take back with you wherever you go. Of if, if it be your will, O oh God, glorify your servant, Father Tolton, by granting the favor we now request through his intercession, so that all may know the goodness of this priest whose memory looms large in the church he loved. Amen. So the second um, of the six is uh, the venerable mother, Henriette DeLille, uh, who is from New Orleans um, and uh, is, is beloved there in the Archdiocese of New Orleans and just uh, uh, an amazing figure um, in that city and in the Catholic community for a number of reasons. Uh, so uh, Mother Henriette was born a free woman of color in New Orleans. And um, the sisters of the family don't shy away from this. You can, you can see that she's very, very um, fairly complected. And so she's, she's a mixed ancestry. So her mother and her sisters um, were uh, embedded in a system called plissage. Right, where Creole women were the mistresses of, of white men, um, bore their children. They weren't married to them, but they were kind of owned by them. But it was a life at the time that was considered um, the most comfortable kind of life that you could have if you were born into this particular circumstance. So uh, Henriette's mom 
ancestors. And as a child, Henrietta herself was um, embedded in this life. And she extricated herself. Um, you know, it's important to know she became a nun in 1834, but she was um, educated um, at a Catholic school for girls of color, even then in the early, early 1800s. So the, as I mentioned, the first um, integrated schools in America that were, were Catholic schools, and those were schools in New Orleans, the Ursulines um, offered schools in like the early 18th century, like the, the old school, as we would say, where I come from, they're OGs, right? They are originals. <laughs> um, so, uh, so Henriette was educated in, in that. So I could, you could just see her, this 15, 16 year old, and um, just the kind of vibrant, dynamic person she is with a foot in these two worlds, right? So she's teaching at this Catholic school as a teen, um, and she's embedded in this plissage system that her mom and her sisters and others are in New Orleans. Uh, and so she takes the, she takes the leap, uh, and um, she takes her vows. Um, but prior to that, she had been an educator. So almost immediately, um, you, know, you can do the math, and you can see she was a very, very young person. Um, when all of these things are happening, she's in her early 20s. She's the age of our students here at Notre Dame, uh, and she's founding a religious order. Uh, the Sisters of the Holy Family, and I don't have to tell you about who they are, what they've done, or what they mean to our faith, but this is, you know, it's a 24-year-old young woman who, who's, at the, who's at, the, at, the, at the foundation of this. And um, so immediately they take on the care for the city's poor and the education for the city's poor, and again, this idea of, uh, of free education. And so there was a distinction um, in, in New Orleans, it's where my, my family comes from. My, my family and, and, and Henriette Delos' family kind of overlapped with both von Sants. Um, so the, the use in, in, in uh, New Orleans of the term of color normally meant someone like Henriette de Lille. Um, and it meant someone of mixed ancestry, a different kind of class. A lot of them had been offered their freedom um, in New Orleans, prior to New Orleans becoming a, a, a state, so it wasn't unusual. Um, still was integrated. There was a, you know, um, a, a hierarchy there. It was more porous than in the rest of the US. But when you talk about slaves, um, that was a different group of people. So Henriette de Lille and the Sisters of the Holy Family said, we are going to educate and care for enslaved individuals. So they offered free education. So that was really the first, right? Free education for black slaves. Um, again, the Catholic Church, the Sisters of the Holy Family. Ultimately, the Sisters of the Holy Family um, started at St. Mary's Academy, which runs to this day. Um, Henriette was a godmother to many, a witness at weddings, uh, 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 an intercessor on earth, if you will, and a, uh, an interlocutor who really spoke passionately about uh, the most vulnerable communities um, in New Orleans. Uh, and she opened uh, America's first Catholic home for the elderly. So there's a lot of reasons for, for uh, Henriette's cause for canonization. Um, you know, a servant of slaves, she lived a holy, prayerful, and virtuous life. Um, she lived out her prayer, I believe in God, I hope in God, I love, I want to live and die for God. And we'll come back to, like, what are some of the through lines, but again, just the humility, the dignity, the devotion, um, living out her, her Catholic vows, right, in action. And I was, as I was preparing to come in, I was looking at the images we have on the wall just outside on the other side of this auditorium. You see it. It's like the true way we live our life is to manifest hope through action. And so you see that in Father Tolton, and you see that in Henriette um, de Lille as well. Again, these are two of the three that... Um, African-Americans that are venerable. So they're in that second step, right? So, so there is some serious consideration, but they have uh, much further to travel. Um, so here's the prayer for petition for, for Mother Henriette. Oh, good and gracious God, you called Henriette de Lille to give herself in service and in love to the slaves and the sick, to the orphan and the aged, to the forgotten and the despised. Grant that inspired by her life, we might be renewed in heart and mind. If it be your will, may she one day be raised to the honor of sainthood. By her prayers, may we live in harmony and peace through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. So both Henriette, uh, Mother Henriette, and Father Augustus were religious. Um, Venerable Pierre, as uh, I was saying to my wife, uh, he was just a dude, right? He was like... <laughs> A hairdresser, a philanthropist, like, uh, I mean, I, I could just see him I, having lived many years of my life in New York. Like, he was a, he was a dude. Uh, born in Haiti, brought to New York, apprenticed to be a hairdresser um, by, by his master and mistress. Um, 
he became um, the go-to hairdresser in the city of New York uh, in the early 1800s. You could imagine, right? Uh, he was a person of means and substance, and he was making a ton with, 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 with his mistress, the, the, the family who owned him. So he bought the freedom for his wife and his family. He was like, I'm, fine. I'm doing fine, right? He was, he was making a ton of money. So in 1807, uh, so he, you know, uh, he's in his late 30s. So he, he lived a, a, a lot of life at that point. He was freed. Um, but uh, he was wealthy, right? He was probably one of the handful of wealthiest African Americans in the city at the time. Um, but he was just wealthy outright. Uh, so he and his wife, um, Juliette Noel, uh, who I wouldn't be surprised if, if, if she became a part of the conversation down the road, they opened up their home um, as an orphanage, um, as an employment bureau, as a, as a refuge. Um, he was one of the key um, kind of benefactors in raising funds for St. Patrick's Cathedral, um, the, the St. Patrick's Cathedral uh, original and where it's currently located. Uh, he was a leading um, New Yorker of his day. Uh, he began the city's first school for uh, black children um, you know, in the early 19th century. Uh, he helped provide funds for the Oblate Sisters of Providence. Um, he was committed to, to serving others. Uh, so he was not a, a religious, but um, clearly involved in the same kind of hope and action, the education, the care for the poor, um, using his wealth, essentially giving away his wealth, opening his home to others. Uh, so the, the key group behind his, his, um, his cause is the Archdiocese of New York. So there's a ton of materials, but if, you, if, you, if you're perusing the Archdiocese of New York paper, uh, pages on the internet, you look up um, uh, Pierre Toussaint, there are films and other things and real uh, testimonies uh, that, um, that, that really speak to his life. So this is the, the um, prayer for petition. And, and at my age, I should have printed these slides out one per page so that I could actually, it's actually big enough to read. So I'm going I'm to do what I tell my students, never do and turn away from you and read this. Um, Lord God, source of love and compassion, we praise and honor you for the virtuous and charitable life of our brother in Christ, the venerable Pierre Toussaint. Inspired by the example of our Lord, Jesus Pierre worshiped you with love and served your people with generosity. He attended Mass daily and responded to the practical and spiritual needs of friends and strangers, or the rich and poor, the sick and homeless of 19th century New York. Um, if it is your will, let the name of Venerable Pierre Toussaint be officially raised to the ranks of saint, so that the world may know this Haitian New Yorker who refused to hate or be selfish, but instead lived to the full commandments of heaven and the divine law of love, love for God and neighbor. By following his example and asking for his prayers, may we too be counted among the blessed in heaven. We ask this through Christ our Lord. Amen. Amen. So the next three are um, servants of God in the church. So the first of these is Mother Mary Lang. Um, and uh, her home archdiocese in the U.S. is Baltimore. Uh, she, just, she did amazing work in the Maryland area in the early 19th century. She was actually born in Santiago de Cuba, moved to Baltimore um, as a young girl, was highly educated, spoke many languages, including uh, French. And there was a large influx of, of French Catholics, many of the um, migrant Catholics in the, in the U.S. at that time were French speakers. Uh, so she used her money because she had means, um, like Pierre Toussaint, uh, to educate uh, children of color. So she had started her own like, kind of, I don't know what you call it, like homeschool uh, for the children of color in Maryland. And this is a different use of the term of color. They, these are African-American slaves um, and immigrants that Mother Mary Lang is, is educating at the time. Um, Archbishop Whitfield approached her. Um, and said, you, um, we, we need to formalize this in the church. And again, I mean, so the, like, there's, a, there's a checkered legacy, but I, I feel it's, it's like, a, like a historical understanding would uh, lead us to be much prouder of our legacy, 
right? There were Father McGurs and there were Archbishop Whitfields. And so Archbishop Whitfield was, was key. He was essential in helping uh, Mother Mary Lang start what became the Oblate Sisters of Providence, the first congregation for women of African heritage in the United States, um, ultimately um, starting uh, St. Francis Academy, um, which is uh, the longest continuing running um, school in the, in the United States that serves uh, African Americans. It's a Catholic school. Um, so she was uh, another mover and shaker. Uh, she was the superior general. Um, so she really was kind of a principal. Um, she was a superior general. Uh, she was an advocate in the community. She was a philanthropist, you know, so there was a, a, a lot of different aspects to her life and to her work um, that are important in the, um, in the years prior to emancipation. And the Sisters of Oblate Providence, obviously, they're still around today um, doing a lot of work and they were able to, to do more after emancipation. But before emancipation, um, which was most of her life, uh, Mother Mary Lane kind of carried this banner. Um, so she practiced her faith um, she persevered, um, you know, in spite of the poverty and racial injustice, and she never lost faith. Um, and you know, she gave all of her possessions um, to this cause, really to the school and to the order. She was um, the original benefactor of St. Francis Academy and the Oblate Sisters of Providence. So this is a, a, a quote from uh, uh, Sister Mary Reginald Gerdes, who was a, a principal um, at St. Francis Academy. She says, what were the works of Mother Mary Lang? We know of her private school in the early 1800s, um, of her academy in 1828, um, her religious foundation in 1829, the Oblate Sisters. But there was also an orphanage, a widow's home, spiritual direction, religious education classes, vocational training. The early sisters did home visiting and conducted night school so black adults could learn to read and write. When the Civil War was over, Baltimore was flooded with black war orphans. Mother Mary Lang gathered 60 of them and began a new era of caring for destitute children. She was a religious pioneer. Um, so again, a force of nature, just in the first of the four steps right now for um, Mother Mary Lang. This is her um, prayer um, for the cause of her canonization. I'll, I'll come over here because I'm going to play a video on the next slide. Almighty and eternal God, you granted Mother Mary Lang extraordinary trust in your providence. Um, you endowed her with humility, courage, holiness, and an extraordinary sense of service to the poor and sick. You enabled her to found the Oblate Sisters of Providence and provide educational, social, and spiritual ministry, especially um, to the African American community. Mother Lang's love for all enabled her to see Christ in each person, and the pain of prejudice and racial hatred never blurred that vision. Deign to raise her to the highest honors of the altar in order that through her intercession, more souls may come to a deeper understanding and a more fervent love of you. Heavenly Father, glorify your heart by granting also our favors, which we ask through the intercession of your faithful servant, Mother Mary Lyme. Okay. So I thought I'd introduce you to the fifth. Um, Sister Thea Lang, with just a quick snippet, since she happened to live in the, during the television age. <laughs> She's, we actually have video of, of, of Thea Bowman. What does it mean to be black in the church and society? I want to tell you about the church. First of all, um, th she's speaking to the, bis the bishops, the USCCB. This is a famous uh, speech. Sometimes I feel 
So that says a lot <laughs> about who Sister Thea, Thea Bowman was. Um, so uh, although she's a, a, a servant of God, I, it's my guess that it, it, she'll, she'll be the first African-American saint. Um, I think that, I imagine that her case will move, move quickly um, through, uh, through its process, but partly because she's, she's a, she lived in the television age and, and um, is a pretty dynamic individual. Um, she was an only child. Um, her father, Theon, and her mother, Mary Esther, um, raised her in Canton, Mississippi. And she asked them to be converted to Catholicism as a young child, largely because of the inspiration um, that she drew uh, as a, a student at the Holy Child Jesus Church and School in Canton. Um, and at the age of 15, you know, I think I'm, I'm a parent, many of you are like, 15 is young, right? I think I have a 21-year-old and a 17-year-old. And at the age of 15, she asked her parents to leave home, to move to La Crosse, Wisconsin, to join the Franciscan Sisters of Perpetual Adoration, um, who are her primary advocates. And again, I have a lot of resources, but you, like, listen to the sisters talk about the influence that Thea Bowman had on them. At the time, she integrated, at least racially integrated that order, and they took her in. And I was listening as I was preparing for this talk to uh, um, like a podcast with one of the current sisters. And uh, she said that, I, I can't remember exactly how she worded it, but like, she came in and she became one of us, um, but she remained Thea, right? She, she taught us, she moved us. It wasn't about her becoming like us. It was part of us learning about her and what drove her and her passions um, that we, we shaped each other. There was a mutual shaping, a mutual formation that happened here. Um, and it's a really powerful testimony. Um, she was an educator. Uh, she was a lifelong educator. Uh, she earned her doctorate, and she became a professor of English and linguistics. Uh, and there are a lot of uh, quotes that are attributed to, to Thea, but this one is this community message, um, if you get, give. Uh, if you learn, teach. Uh, she was one of the founding uh, faculty members of the Institute for Black Catholic Studies uh, at Xavier University. Uh, and again, there are, uh, there are too many kind of you know, famous quotes uh, to, to have them all, but these are a couple that I thought that I would share. Um, we we unite ourselves with Christ's redemptive work when we reflect to our brothers and sisters God's healing, God's forgiveness, and God's unconditional love, right? I mean, it's just a, a very, very powerful statement. Another, I think, probably um, the one you hear the most is attributed to her. I think the difference between me and some people is that I'm content to do my little bit. Sometimes people think they have to do big things in order to make change, but if each one would light a candle, we'd have a tremendous light. And that was how she um, tried to live her life. Uh, she lost both of her parents. Um, to cancer. Uh, she addressed the U.S. bishops and, you know, uh, uh, bolstered a little bit by the changes that had happened in, in society via the civil rights movement. She was able to begin a public dialogue as a sister about what it meant to be black and Catholic in the United States. So that, that testimony that she offered to the U.S. bishops, which began with a, with a hymnal about being a motherless child in her own church as a religious, really lit a candle, but the way that she was able to do that with a dignity and with a gravity, um, but also with compassion and love, um, it, it, it yields a tremendous fruit that, that continues to this day um, when you think about you know, who has advocated for the cause of, of black Catholics more fervently um, than Thea Bowman, and she's at the top of that list. Um, so there are many reasons for her cause for canonization. Um, she taught um, about the joy of being a Christian. She was highly acclaimed um, to say that she was a powerful, dynamic force of nature as a speaker is an understatement, right? Um, you just saw in that, in that really short clip. Um, she embraced her suffering with a willing spirit. She um, herself, like her parents, was claimed way too young by cancer. Um, and she used that to offer testimony um, to others 
finally, she, uh, she, she tried to, to, to kind of bring this together in um, uh, the quote I have it here at the end. I, I don't make sense of suffering. I try to make sense of life. I try each day to see God's will. Right? And so when we think about, as you were all saying at the beginning, like what does it mean to imitate? What is it? Uh, it's partly this, like how, how we face our own struggles um, is, is, a, is a chance to complain. It's also a chance to offer testimony um, to why faith in God matters, what it looks like, how we manifest. Um, so here's the prayer for petition for Thea Bowman. If it be your will, O God, glorify our beloved sister Thea Bowman by granting the favor we now request through her intercession so that all may know of her goodness and holiness and may imitate her love for you and your church. We ask this through your Son and our Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. So last, certainly not least, servant of God, Julia Greeley. Um, her home archdiocese is Denver. Um, and again, the folks in Denver are enthusiastic about uh, servant of God, Julia Greeley. Um, so she's known as Denver's angel of charity. So she um, was born into slavery, and um, she, she endured slavery much, much longer than, than any of the rest, um, well into her, her, her adult years. And she, she's also from Missouri. Um, so in her, it, it's hard to say when she was born. She could have been born in the 1830s or the 1840s, but she was definitely an adult, and she moved uh, to Denver after emancipation to work for a wealthy family. Uh, but she began to become known as this woman who would take everything she had, everything she earned, um, and she had this little red wagon that she would just load up with firewood, with food, with whatever people needed. And she would travel around at night, like Santa Claus, right? And drop these things off on people's porches, on their doorsteps. They wake up in the morning, and here's, here's food, here's firewood. And um, she didn't want to embarrass them. She didn't want to be seen. So she's working all day for families um, of means. And then she is working all night for the community. And she became known as this angel of mercy, some called her, the angel of charity. Others um, called her. Um, she joined the, the Catholic Church at, this, at uh, Sacred Heart Parish in Denver. Um, she was just considered the most enthusiastic promoter um, of devotion to the Sacred Heart that the Jesuits said they had ever seen. She was a daily communicant. Um, and you know, when she died, uh, there, she made the paper because she was that famous. But um, you know, I was watching a video, and, and, and people were talking about the testimony of the community um, walk through the parish to, to view her body for hours and hours and hours and hours. Like, it just could not stop people from pouring in, right? Um, because of the impact that this woman had uh, on people's lives. Uh, so I, I want to make sure there, there's Q&A. So I'll, I'll just um, offer this, this prayer and then just speed through a little bit of the end. Heavenly Father, your servant, Julia Greeley, dedicated her life to honoring the sacred heart of your son and to the humble service of the poor. Grant to us a generous heart like your son's, and if it be in accordance with your holy will, please grant us favor we now ask through Julia's intercession. We pray this through Christ our Lord. All right. So what do they stand for? Um, three things that I think are really important, uh, and John asked me to tie these all together. African diaspora Catholic education. Um, we find ourselves in a moment now where there's a lot of division, and people talk about what does healing look like? There can be, to me, no action that's more anti-racist, pro-integration, pro-humanity than Catholic education. And all these folks, whether it's Mother Mary Lang bringing in people through the back door or Mother Henriette um, offering a school and free education for slaves or uh, Thea Bowman who dedicated her life as an educator or Pierre Toussaint, they were all, all advocates for education because they understood there's a key connection between human dignity and literacy, right? And that's how I really encountered these folks. The, the, the illiteracy that we have in our contemporary society is, um, I think, the biggest barrier to collective human dignity. And so they pushed for that. And, and they show how the church, the, particularly the Catholic church, was out front in educating the poor, out front in integration in this country um, long before there were even public schools or, or, or legal integration. They embodied. Catholic social teachings and what I consider a racially aspiring America. You know, somewhere on the journey, 
right, to, to our better selves. But the Catholic social teachings is, is, is really kind of the, the, the Bible brought down to, to zero feet off the ground. Right? I mean, you, you, it, it, it's the Bible on the ground as I think about it. It's how we live, it's how we work, it's how we operationalize. What is it we're called to do? And so they lived the Catholic social teaching, um, particularly, uh, you know, John and I did a, um, it was a De Nicola panel where we were asked to talk about this and we each had to pick a, a, a couple of the pillars of Catholic social teaching and I, I, I focus on solidarity and the call to family, community and participation, which you certainly see. Um, Christocentric approaches to racism and racial healing as well. Um, a few other things as we think about diaspora Catholic education, we need the six to guide us. Um, as as the, the gentleman in the back was saying, like they guide us, right? These saints guide us. And we think about what does it mean to reinvent Catholic education for the 21st century as, as, as the church changes, right? As the needs change, um, we need these six to guide us. Um, there are so many reasons why we need to think about changing education in this country, right? 85% um, of teenagers in the juvenile justice system um, have what's considered a low level of literacy. Seven out of 10 adult prisoners um, find it hard to read at the fourth grade level. Now, what's the other side of this story? Um, Catholic education, 99% of Catholic high school students graduate in the US. So I've heard the superintendents of the schools, like the art schools in, in New York, for instance, who say the graduation rate for African American males in the public schools in New York is 32%. Graduation rate, African American males in the Archdiocese of New York is 97%, three to one. Um, so these are huge successes, right? And, and there are studies that show um, African Americans take harder classes, math and science classes, in Catholic school than on average. Right? So there's all sorts of reasons why um, we should be inspired by this and we should be bolstered by this. As we double down on education as our ministry, um, as one of our core ministries in the mid-21st century, we have to think about that vacuous space and who do we imitate? Right? It's, it's these six, amongst others, that we need to lift up to guide us, to intercede for us, to help us to have their devotion, their passion, right? their commitment to God, their, their indefatigability, right? their indefatigable um, quest for equity and justice. Right? That's what they offer us. So there's all sorts of possibilities when we think about this. We think about what it looks like for us. Um, this is just a framework, um, I think, about where uh, you know, we can play a real role in the policy, the teaching, um, the pipeline, the research, all of these areas, right? And so you can think about you know, um, publication. You can think about the venerable <laughs> Sister Thea Bowman or policy. I, mean, I, can, I can see how each of them are, are key here as, as we kind of own this framework. And I really do think that Notre Dame, we should own this. Right? This should be, we are an institution of education. We are a Catholic institution of education. Um, we are probably the most prolific and dynamic and well-resourced Catholic institution for education on the planet. This is us, right? This is what we do. So I'll end here. I like alliteration. <laughs> How do you support these causes, right? Um, so I'll explain. In the parishes and parlors, there's two things. One is his testimony. And so I, I, I was going through a lot of different sites and a lot of different places where people are advocating for saints. And so a big part of it is testimony, just how we begin to share. But the parlors and the parishes is where we do our work. And, and there's two things. One is sharing with people. But two, we need to, be, we need to begin to integrate our parlors and parishes with, the Im, with these images. right? You shouldn't be able to go to a Catholic church, a, uh, a, you know, a cathedral, a basilica, without seeing these images in the United States. So we need, we need to integrate the walls. Sometimes I will say, um, you know, when I look up in some of our most beloved basilicas, I was like, you know, we need to integrate heaven. Uh, I mean, look up the next time you look up, right? You know, it's like, we need, just like, we need, to, we need to integrate the walls. We need to integrate the ceiling. Um, I have no doubt that heaven is integrated, but the, but, but the representations of it are not. So we need to do that. 
Right? We need to do that work. And in our parlors, in our own homes, and we need to invite people in. We need to talk about it. Obviously, these prayers, right? These prayers of petition um, are important for us. Patronage, there are causes that are connected um, to these venerables and servants of God. But just in general, I think patronage for, for Catholic education. Um, I can think of a few other areas that are, that are up there, but, but certainly our patronage of Catholic education is important. And then finally, the petition. So I'll end, um, which is saying that November is Black Catholic History Month. And so it's a perfect opportunity to take this up. Again, I just thank you, John, for taking me on this journey. It has been, um, I thought it was going to be hard, but it was really um, fulfilling. It was kind of like soul quenching. Um, to do this work and to get to know and love these people even more intimately. And I hope you take that a little bit with yourselves um, as you go out uh, in the world immediately to the, hopefully what will be a victorious game, but after that, <laughs> to your own parlors and parishes. So thank you so much. Yeah.